Today is January 26, 2016, and we are with Beatrice Haddock, B-E-A-T-R-I-C-E, -E, middle initial J, Haddock, H-A-D-D-O-C-K. My name is Mona Reno, M-O-N-A-R-E-N-O, -E and we are in Sparks, Nevada, at the Star Morning Star Morning Star Assisted Living, and um, we are here to interview Beatrice for uh, her role at the Stead Air Force Base. Uh, primarily, we will talk about her uh, entire life, but we the purpose of this is because of the Stead Air Force Base Museum Project. So, hi, Beatrice. Hello. So thank you for letting us come visit you. I'm very happy to be here. The other people with us are John and Christiane Hamill and Sheila Lawton, that's Beatrice's stepdaughter. So, and uh, we'll try not to talk over each other and mostly the, you know, the interview is about you, but I may ask you questions. So we have in front of us some uh, photographs of Stead but um, first I'd like to have you tell us where you were born and your parents' names, a little bit about growing up. I was born October 9th, 1922. My parents were Maria and Frank Kavarsky. I was born in Waukegan, Illinois and had a, Waukegan, Illinois incidentally is practically sits on Lake Michigan very lovely, lovely setting, and spent most of my life in Waukegan, traveled a lot as a young lady, worked everywhere, and worked in Europe for a number of years, and uh, uh, finally moved to San Francisco and lived in the San Francisco area for a good number of years. Met my husband in 1960, and we were married in October of 1961, and I moved from San Francisco to Reno, Nevada, and we lived here until 1968, and then we moved back to San Mateo, California, which is a suburb of San Francisco. It's right on the peninsula, and we lived in uh, uh, San Mateo until my husband passed away and I kept on living there until Jack and Sheila moved me to Reno. <laughs> 2015. And I... <laughs> In 2015, right. Sheila says. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, and uh, your parents' names? My father's name was Frank Kavarsky. My mother's maiden name was Trubak, T-R-U-B-A-C. And when she married my father, she became Mary Kowarski. Mm -hmm. And um, you uh, told me earlier that you um, have a year of university. And so tell me about your schooling. My schooling? I attended, of course, grade school until I was uh, graduated and then went to Waukegan Township High School, which is in Waukegan, Illinois. And uh, then I went to Northwestern University for one year, and then I went to business college. And that's what led to your long career as a stenographer? A sec yes, a tech secretary, secretary, right. Mm -hmm. And um, so you just said you traveled a lot in Europe. I worked in Europe for two years. I worked for the Air Force for two years. And where at? In Wiesbaden, Germany. And what you traveled all over Europe. So that was in the fifties. I went there in 1950. In 1950 to 1952. As a single woman. As a single woman. <laughs> in bombed out Germany. Wow, <laughs> that was, must have been something. It was an incredible experience. Wow. So you saw all the cities gone. I traveled all over Europe. And then I went back to Europe several times as a visitor. And watched it change then, while well, they rebuilt Oh, I it. saw a lot of changes, particularly in Germany. It began to build its, clean itself up, build up. I can remember walking over rubble, I mean, just rubble all over the street. Half of building standing. It was incredible. It was an incredible sight. Wow. 
Okay, and then you came back to uh, the U.S., and that was through your employment also? Well, when I was through with my assignment in Europe, I came back to Waukegan and stayed there for several months, and then we moved to California. And we moved in 1951. We moved to San Mateo, California. And who is we? My mother and I. Because oh. my brother was a merchant marine in San Francisco. And he was living in hotels and so on and so forth. And I had made trips to California and I fell in love with it. And I knew I wanted to live there. So I uprooted my mother and we went to California and bought a home there and your lived father in had, San Mateo, California. Your father had deceased? Oh yes, he was deceased. I was nine years old when he passed away. All right. Um, anything you, when you were working with the Air Force, you were a civilian contractor? What? You were a civilian contractor? With I worked the, for the military? Air Force. Oh, so you were actually in the Air Force? Or you no, were a civilian? I, worked, I, was, I was a government employee working for the Air Force. Okay, yeah. And then when you went to San Mateo, you got another job? Oh, I had several jobs there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Several jobs. Now, I was sort of wondering, um, there's a lot of commemorations going on over World War II and um, people on the home front and what they did during the war on the home front, but you were already uh, working as a civilian at the end of the war then mm -hmm. for the government. That's correct. But I was in war-torn Germany. Yeah. I mean, I... There was a half a building standing, or it was just incredible. I can't even describe it to you. Yeah, there's right. rubble everywhere. Did your mother do any work, um, you know, in factories or anything? My mother was a maid at the very famous Deer Path Inn in Lake Forest, Illinois, a very exclusive, very exclusive hotel, and she was the maid there. Yeah, neat. Okay, so when you're in San Mateo. You meet Frank. Oh, I, I didn't meet Frank until 19... When did the Olympics start? 1960? Yeah, the Olympics came to Tahoe in 1960, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. And I met Frank on New Year's Day, the 1st of January in 1960. Where at? And we were... My two girlfriends and I were at a bar and we were drinking at this very, very, called the Villa Chartier. It was a very lovely, lovely place. And we were drinking and these gentlemen came in and of course the bar was crowded. And they said, if you girls move over, we'll buy you a drink. So we moved over and we became acquainted and uh, uh, Frank and I were talking and I said, oh, what a nice gentleman, blah, blah, blah. And he asked me for my phone number, and I said, I don't give my phone number to anybody. So my girlfriend and I went to Tahoe to the Olympics, and he said, well, when you're there, give me a call. Well, I never called him, because I never, I never called anybody in the mail. So uh, anyway, he found out through my girlfriend what my phone number was. So he called me one day, I came home and my mother said, Frank called you. And I said, Frank? I don't know any Frank. Who could it be? And I said, well, I don't know who it is. And he called back and he said, oh, I met you at the Villa Chardier. Oh, that Frank, yeah. I said, would you like to go out for a drink? And I said, well, I didn't have anything to do. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll meet you. So I met him and we had a drink and it went on from there. How old were you? I was 30, 37 years old. I had been married previously. Uh -huh. So I wasn't, I wasn't a single girl, I had been married. And uh, so as I said, we went out from there. Yeah. Huh. Had a beautiful romance. Oh yeah, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, and so, how did you get to Stead Air Force Base? North well, when I Reno? married Frank, I was working for the government already. I had a government job. And when I married Frank, 
I, I did not want to break my government record. I wanted to keep on working. And he said, well, there's a Stead Air Force Base. It's a government uh, place. Why don't you apply there? And I went to Stead and applied, and I was interviewed and, and hired on the spot. So I just transferred to Stead. And Frank was already employed in Oh, Nevada? he had his own business. He was in real estate. In northern Nevada already? Or? In Reno. Oh, when you He was in... always in business for himself, right, honey? Yes. He never yes. worked for anybody. No, he did Except he during the him. war. Except yes. during the war, he worked yeah. at Stead. Oh, he did too? Mm-hmm. Well, well, Stead was a, uh, a government facility at the time. Uh-huh. And what did he do at Stead? What did he do? We'll talk I more about no you. I have no idea what he did What there. he did at Stead? Sheila, well, do you He was in the Air Force. Oh, he was in the Air Force? No, he worked for the Air Force. He worked for the Air Force. Oh, uh-huh. Well, so that worked really great that, that then you could just get on there and continue your civil service. Oh, yes, I just uh-huh. transferred, right. And so what year was that when you arrived at Stead Air Force Base? 1961. Mm-hmm. And oh. I, I was one of the last, I locked the door on Stead Air Force Base. Oh, no Joella way. Mioli and myself. And a major. Uh huh. And what did you do at Stead? I was a secretary. And who for? What? Who for? I worked in the dispensary. There was a hospital. It, Stead was a survival school and a chopper base, a helicopter base. So there were airmen and officers that were sent out into the wilderness. Survival. All they had was a needle and some very, very bare implements. They were dropped off into the woods or wherever, and they had to survive. So some suffered from frostbite, and some did well, and, and so they, those that suffered from the elements would end up in the hospital. There was a hospital at Stead Air Force Base, and I worked in the hospital. I worked for, uh, who did I, oh, uh, Dr. Beckert, I worked for Dr. Beckert. He was a surgeon, a surgeon that would take care of these airmen that were afflicted in their assignment out in the wilderness. And that was what you did like for the whole time you were there? Well, I worked in the dispensary and then I, I was upgraded, I kept moving around instead. Mm-hmm. Well, we do have some pictures here um, that are of Stead Air Force Base and other places in your career, and we're just going to start with uh, number one, and if you want to look at this and tell me what this is. We'll this look- is Lieutenant Torno. This is at Stead, and this is when I was promoted. I was promoted. After I left the dispensary, I was promoted, and then I worked for him. And his, he was head of the recreation department at Stead. Mm-hmm. Torno, and I see his name tag, T-O-R-N-O. T-O-R-N-O, Torno. Mm-hmm. And on the back it says June 1964. Right. Okay. And let's see, picture number two is of four people. Well, this is Nalsnik. And what the heck was, he was Italian, what the heck was his name? Now Nelsnick is the gentleman right seated here. in the suit right. at the table. This is me. And then what the heck Beatrice was his... is to his left. What the heck was his name? So is this at the uh, commissary? We, well, we were just having cocktails. But on the base? No, this was in San Francisco. Oh. This was in San Francisco. Oh, okay. The um, Marine Corps. Sergeant Bailey. Oh, Sergeant ba- and Sergeant Pizzo, right, okay. Oh, uh-huh. And, um... Nalisnik. Nalisnik. And Chief you... Warrant Officer. Oh, Chief Warrant Officer, Nalisnik, mm-hmm. 1960. So this was still uh, See, earlier. These were, these were Marines. They were Marines. She's talking about the two gentlemen on the left and right. Uh, he was a Marine also. Oh. He was in civilian clothes, but he was a Marine. He mm-hmm. was a chief warrant officer. Okay, so as I read the back, 
It's Sergeant Bailey. Is this? That's Sergeant Bailey on yes. the far left, uh -huh. and then Beatrice is sitting beside that, and then the Chief Warrant Officer Melisnik is seated beside her in right. his suit, and, Pizzo. and then Sergeant Pizzo right. is, is also seated at the this table in 1960. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this one is a big long group picture with yeah, maybe that's 30 the whole, people in that's it. That's the whole Marine Corps group. It was the 12th Marine Corps Reserve and Recruitment District. Wow. Okay. It says on the back. It says Marine Corps Group, San Francisco, 1960, Christmas, Christmas office party. party. And Beatrice is third from oh, the this right, is me right here. This is Lieutenant McGaldy. And Lieutenant McGaldy is just to her left. Yeah. This and I can't. I can't identify the other people. I can't remember his name. Okay. So that's in San Francisco, and I was looking all over for that damn picture. This is picture number four. It's two gentlemen holding a huge eagle. It says, Stead Air Force Base Dispensary Golden Eagle shot wounded 1962. It's gorgeous. Do you know who the gentlemen are? No. I, let me see. He's a civilian. He's not an officer. He, he was a um, corpsman. I can't remember his name, but he was a corpsman in the mm -hmm. dispensary. That's the gentleman on the right I with the striped shirt. He was an, I don't know who they are. I can't remember their names. It's a magnificent bird. Isn't that gorgeous? Mm -hmm. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at the size of that bird. Yeah. Gorgeous. Hmm. Yeah, okay, now, picture number four <laughs> says, wanted for speeding, 395 North. I was always late for work. <laughs> picture number five, and it's a Fairlane. That's this, a Ford Fairlane. This is your car? That was my car, and I, I was always late for work, so I would barrel down 395, 90 miles an hour. <laughs> So it's not kidding. So they caught that picture. <laughs> and in the background, is that on the Air Force Base? That's Those, right on the base. So yeah. the buildings in the back are on the air right. base. And it says Stead Air Force Base 1962 on the back of picture number five. It's a great car. It's a 1957 four lane. Yeah. Wow. Okay, picture number six. On the back says Stead Air Force Base Group, 1964, Jack Lawton. Hey, Langston. Langston. And Pat Finlayson. Now, Jack Langston. Finlayson. Married. He married one of the casino operate one of the casino owner's daughter. Was it Hera? Did Hera have a daughter? So tell me about the picture while Sheila's thinking. Did Hera have a daughter? Yeah. He did. I went to school with her. Okay, well, Jack Langston married one of Hera's daughters. And I don't know whether it was Twyla? Yeah. I don't know, I don't know which one. So I don't either. You are the person this on the right. This is me, and this is Pat Finlayson. And Pat Finlayson, now I can look at that. F I N L L A Y S O N. Oh, okay. And her husband was in the service and he was the fire chief. Oh, uh huh. Looks like a Christmas. You're getting a, a candy cane yeah. full of candy. And there's a bird house in front of it. Tell me about those birds. What are those birds? I don't know what They're the heck they are. Parakeets or something. Was that on base too? That was on base, yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay. Picture number seven is uh, says nothing on the back, and okay. it's you and Hartung. H -A -R that was Lieutenant Hartung, and whose birthday? It it's was his birth birthday. Hmm. And I think I baked a cake for him. Looks chocolate. Yeah. Hmm. That's lovely. This is the same picture that's in the background, right. I think, is I don't know. I, I gave that to somebody. I don't know who. 
Yeah. It was a beautiful picture. That was Lieutenant Hartog. It was his birthday, and I baked that cake. And um, this was the gentleman you see you worked for? No, we don't have a picture of him. That's oh, Torno. That's Torno, right. It's in San Francisco. Why don't you put his name down in the back? Hart oh, it's there, okay. Yeah, he's good. you can read yeah. his badge. What did, was his capacity out at Stead? What? What did he do out at Stead? He was, he was my boss. Just before Stead closed, he was assigned to the Recreation Department. Oh, uh -huh. And he was my boss. Alrighty. For a few months, and then everything just went downhill. So what year do you think this picture was then? I think that was 19... 1968. I think it was 1968. Okay, we're moving on to picture number oh, eight. Oh, that's the Marine Corps. That's what I worked for the Marine Corps. Oh, yep, it says 1960. It says... Mag Lieutenant Magaldi, Nalsnik, and uh, Colonel Dugas. Okay, and that would be uh, left to right. This is this is Magaldi. This is Nalsnik, and that's the major. Okay. Yep, they're in the right order. Nineteen sixty, and it's a cake. They're cutting a cake with the. Is it a birthday? It is a Marine Corps symbol on it. Oh well, it was maybe a, I don't know what it is. Yeah. So that's he was a good looking guy. Yeah. He was very good looking. Uh -huh. Well, they're all pretty dapper, aren't uh -huh. they? Like they make them take care of themselves uh -huh. when they're Marines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> Nalsnik again. Yeah, that's the. Yep. So, yep, Nalsnik and Magaldi. No. And that on the back it says 1961. So this is still in this San guy Francisco. Is. I don't know who he is. Yeah, there's names on it. Did they autograph it? They autographed it. Who is that guy? Well, his name isn't on it. So we have the autographs of of uh Nelsnick and Tarno. I mean, uh, Mag Magaldi. Magaldi. Yeah, well, that's kind of uh -huh. fun, isn't it? I wonder what the occasion was that they signed it for you. Doesn't it say? No, just because well, it was 1961. 1961. Right. Mm -hmm. He was good looking. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all out of uniform uh -huh. in this one, in their civvies at some sort of festivity. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Number 10. Says, says Colonel Hunt and Major, and I, you've said his name so many times, Glugas. This is who? It says Colonel Hunt, Major De Lugas. Okay. Mm -hmm. 1960. So that's still in this San is Francisco. The this is the Colonel. That's the one and on the far left. This is the colonel, and this is the major. I don't know who this guy is. So, this guy. Okay, the one in the far left, we don't have a name for. All right. But this is the colonel, and this is uh, the major. So, colonel's in the center, and the major's on the right. And they're cutting a cake also. Yeah. You guys ate a lot of cake. Well, there are a lot of birthdays, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, that's in San Francisco, right. too. They probably had to go out and run laps after every party. Okay, picture number 11. Okay, that's the whole Marine Corps group. It says... Dispersing Office Marine Corps, 1959. Okay, and you are... Where am I? I am I you. there? I don't really see you. Do you see me? Uh-uh. This is uh, Hartley. She was a woman officer. Oh, that's the... And that's Nelsnick. No, so Nelsnick is far right standing. And the I'm not in the picture. Female colonel is just to his left. I don't see him. 
That's not you hiding back no. there. Maybe you're taking it. I have no idea. Huh. I have no idea. This time it looks like boxes of donuts. Don't those look like boxes of donuts? They look like something. I don't know what. They, like yeah, they, I think they are. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, you're not in that one. But these are co-workers. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. That's the whole dispersing office. I wasn't there. I wonder why. Probably had a day off or something. So this one then is a 1959. So we've got pictures of 59 and 60 right, and 61 right. in San Francisco. Right. And then we have some pictures of Stead. Right. Up to about 1968. Right. And so tell me about Stead. Just what was it like working there? It was a wonderful place to work. I enjoyed it very much. I married Frank, and I was working for the government. So I wanted to continue working for the government. So I went to Stead and applied for a job. And I was interviewed by a Dr. Beckert in the dispensary and hired immediately and uh, went back to San Francisco and re transferred from San Francisco to Stead. Mm -hmm. And your mom stayed there with And that your was brother? 1961. Mm -hmm. 1961. Your mom stayed in San Mateo with your brother? What? Your mother, she stayed? She stayed in San Mateo, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where did you live when you lived in Reno? We lived at 3080 Moana Lane. Our house was the last house on Moana Lane. The very last house up in the hill. Skyline. Overlooking the whole city, right? Yeah, so now it's called, Sheila says it's called Skyline. Oh, it always was. Oh, it's Skyline Boulevard. Uh -huh. oh. I mean, that's what they, they, they called that Skyline. The Skyline Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Well, it was beautiful. We had a beautiful view. Yeah, huh, yeah. And so, but you had a pretty good commute. What? Drive. You had a pretty long drive. Well, to get it was out. a good half hour, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was. You know, in... there was, Stead did not have the highways that they have now. It was just a little two lane highway. Coyotes running across the street, pheasants running across the roadway. But it was still 395. It was just two lane. It was a two lane, uh -huh. two lane road. Did you yeah. drive together or did you take separate cars? No, I had my own car. That's that fair lane that you were speeding on all the time. <laughs> it was always late. <laughs> always late. Try to make up for lost time. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's something having two cars and going to work. What? You work different shifts or something? Oh no, it was a regular eight hour shift. You started oh, at eight right. o'clock in the morning and left at four sure. in the afternoon. But I was thinking Frank was out there, but he sure. only worked there during the war. Oh, that right. was, yeah. So he right. was, that was a different situation. Yeah, right. Oh. I forgot to turn that. that rudeness is because I forgot to turn my phone off. Oh, Christiane's taking it away and it'll just stop after a while. So, um, so tell me some more about working at Stead. It was a wonderful place to work. It was a small Air Force base. Mm -hmm. It was a survival training base. Uh -huh. Survival training meant that they would select certain officers and certain airmen, uh -huh. and they would give them a needle and a very sparse survival mm -hmm. kit, I call it, mm -hmm. and drop them off into the woods. They had to survive, winter and summer. Mm -hmm. During the winter, some of the officers and airmen would have frostbite. And during the summer, some of them were very hot. They were suffered from heat, frustration. Yeah. They'd end up in the dispensary. Mm -hmm. But it was a survival school yeah. and a helicopter base. Yeah. She turned off my phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I just turned it down for you. Oh, okay, thank you. So, um, when they came to the d dispensary, what does a secretary in the dispensary do? I mean, what were you... I had to type... The dispensary was for civilians and the military. I worked on the military side. 
And if they had a problem, I had to type up a report as to what was wrong with them, blah, 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 you know, the, the blood tests and so on and so forth. If they had frostbite, we had to chronicle all that information. So it all had to be typed. Oh. So I was the secretary for Dr. Beckert. So you were like keeping patient records. Well, yes. Among right. other things. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. oh. Was it a confidential job? Well, yes, you, all mil medical records are confidential, uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. And then you got promoted. You, what? You, and then you got transferred, promoted. Well, then I was promoted, mm -hmm. and from there I went to, uh, where did I go? Recreation, I believe, Mom. What? Recreation. Recreation, yeah. But where did I go after I left the dispensary? Yeah, I went to the recreation department, right. Um, what kind of recreation? No, oh, wait a minute. I went, I was promoted, I worked, I worked in the, I worked for Dr. Beckert. Then I was promoted and I went to another part of the hospital. Forget what it was. Forget what it was. And then from there I was promoted again, and that's when I left it and went to the recreation department. What did they do for recreation? I was the secretary. Uh -huh. I know, but what kind of recreation did they have? All at recreation. Every, you name it, they had it. They had to recreate the, the airmen and the officers that were there. Oh, for, for military training to keep them fit. Right, right. Oh. They had basketball and football and you name it. They had all kinds of sports oh. for them. And their families? What? And their families? And their families, yes. Because uh -huh. there's housing out there, so that there were people just living right on base. Oh, military. They were all living there, absolutely. Yeah. They had lot, lots of housing for airmen and for officers. And a hospital. Could the families use the hospital? Oh, the hospital there for all military. Oh, but maybe not their families. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, military and the families that were there. Oh, that's Because they were eligible for uh -huh. hospitalization and any kind of medical treatment. So how big was it? I mean, they have, how many beds do you think they Oh, have? I have no idea. It was a pretty good-sized hospital. Have you driven out to Stead? You know, since you've been back this second No, but time? Jack is going to take me. He's going oh, to take yeah. me. <laughs> Good. Oh, yeah. So then you'll see the museum and you'll know what we're up to. Right. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And Colonel Lackey was the head of the, uh, he was he was our base commander, Colonel uh -huh. Lackey. Huh. Yeah. And how long you worked there until they closed the base? I worked there from 1961 to 1968. Uh-huh. And why did they close the base? It was a government closure. Um, just budget cuts, or they it was no longer anymore? it was no longer a necessity. Uh -huh. oh. So it was a burden to the government, and they just closed it. Uh -huh. oh. And so then, you moved again? No, I stayed right in Reno. And what did you do? You still were married to Frank, and you were in Reno still. Did you get another job? No, I did not. Uh -uh. Yeah. And then he passed away, and you went back to San Mateo? No, he didn't pass away here. He passed away in San Mateo. Oh, he did? Mm -hmm. Oh, so you went there together? Yes. Oh. So he was done, and he just retired? We, yeah. We moved in 1968. We moved to San Mateo, California. Right after base closure. Right. Oh. Why was it that you and your friend were the last ones out to lock the door? What? Why was it that you and your friend were the last ones out to lock the door? Because there was base closure. They had to make sure that the buildings were secure, everything was moved out, Every all the buildings had to be cleared. Uh -huh. So there were workmen emptying out the buildings, so on and so forth. And they were outsiders, they were not military or anything, they were uh, professional people. But Joella Mioli was in charge of all the housing, 
So she had to make sure that all those houses were clean and cleared and locked and the whole bit. I was there doing the other stuff, make sure that uh, whatever had to be done I did, okay? Uh -huh. So it was Joella Mioli, myself, and a major, I forget the major's name, we were the three people on the base. So you just went from building to building, looked at it, locked the door? Well, I didn't go from building. That was the majors. He had to go from building to building and make sure that they were clean and secure, the windows were locked, the doors were locked, so on and so forth. Uh -huh. It was a base closure. Yeah. So which door did you lock? What? Which door did you lock? I mean, if you went out there and, and you said, oh, that's the building I left last and locked the door. Well, there were all kinds of buildings. Oh, so you locked lots of buildings. A hobby shop. A, oh, oh. I mean, there were just all kinds of facilities there. Uh -huh. And, of course, Bay's housing. Mm -hmm. They had to make sure that those houses were clean. Yeah. The windows were secure. The, dogs were, the doors were secure. Mm -hmm. It was a big job. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering. I'm, I'm just clarifying because you said you were the last one out and locked the door. I just wondered where that that was, you know, where did you lock that last door and go away? Well, because everything was complete on the base. Uh, was it the recreation building? Everything. Everything. Everything was complete oh, on yeah. the base. Okay. The cafeteria, mm -hmm. the kitchens, everything had to be clean. clean and out. Everything had to be secured. Okay. And it was up to the major and jo Joella Mioli and myself to make sure that all of this was done. Who would you give the key to? The major. No, oh, didn't that He something? was the last to leave. And then drive away. Huh. How'd you feel? Well, it felt odd. I kind of, it was sad for me because yeah. I loved that little base. I loved working there. Yeah. Helicopters weren't uh, very common then. I mean, they were very common. It was oh. a chopper base. Yeah. Well, isn't that kind of unique? What? Isn't that kind of unique to be a chopper base? Not really. Oh. There were chopper bases all over the country. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Did but you get to ride one, in one? I was in a chopper, but I never rode in a chopper. Oh, no. uh -huh. oh. oh, yeah. Well, me neither. I haven't seen them. Uh -huh. But uh, I hear they make you kind of sick. I was just wondering if you got to ride in one. No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> so then you guys, you went to San Mateo, back to California. And, and then what? Well, we lived in California. Just retired. And I, went to work, and I went to work for the Air Force again. Oh, you did? I worked for NASA. Oh. I worked in the Satellite Test Center in Sunnyvale. Oh, wow. It was Air Force. Very high secret. Yeah. Secret, secret, deep, top most secret. Wow. Satellite. Wow, yeah. Huh. Wow. For a while? Hmm? You worked there for years? Oh, I worked there from 19, 19, oh, when did I work there? 1968, until I retired. And when was that? When did I retire? 1985, I believe. Oh, that's 20 A years. Time, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you can't tell us what you did, because it's secret. It was all secret, yeah. Uh -huh. Huh. Even now? I'd rather not discuss it, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. Excellent. I'm very proud of you. Because if secret's a secret mm -hmm. uh, with satellites. So, um, John Hamill told me that you were there when the Challenger exploded. Blew up, right. And, and then that delayed your retirement a what? little. Did that um, delay your retirement? or? No, I, I retired. My husband passed away. And... I, my world fell apart when my husband passed away. Mm -hmm. So I clung in there for a year and I had to retire. Mm -hmm. But when I retired, I was a safety manager. Oh. I was the only female safety manager on the West Coast. Wow. And I worked my way up to a grade called GS-12 which is a very high grade. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. Um, safety, personnel safety? So you had no chemicals? No, or... I had to know everything. You went into the workforce, 
you had to make sure you knew what you were doing because we were working on rockets. Wow. We were working on rockets at the time. And if you press the wrong button, that rocket could go up. <laughs> Is it, um, so, I don't know, to me, it sounds like you needed civil engineering and chemical engineering and... You went to school for that. When I was assigned in the safety department, I had to go to school. I went to school on the West Coast, the East Coast, the middle, middle of it. I went to all kinds of schools, oh. which was necessary for the job. Right, and you must have done well because you well, got it. Because I, I went up the grade, yeah. Yeah. As far as I could go. It sounds fascinating. Was it? It was challenging, though. Huh? It, was, it was challenging, but it was interesting. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it. It was very interesting. So you're a detail-oriented person. What? You're detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. So, well, you had, you, if you did something, you had to do it right. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd have all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And what age were you when you retired? Uh, what age was I? <laughs> 65, I think. Perfect age. I, I, can't, I can't remember. I think I was 65. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you stayed for a little while, and then you moved back to Reno. I moved back to Reno. When Sheila and Jack brought me here. Last June. Oh, last June. Last June. We June of 2015 right. is when you came up here. Mm -hmm. So you were by yourself. I was by myself. Down we there had a home in San Mateo. For quite a while. Yeah. Oh. Did you <laughs> have they, any family nearby? What? Did you have any family nearby? I never had any children. The only children I had was Jack and All Sheila. Here. Their, All of her family is here. Is here. Oh. So there you were. What? So you must have had friends and... Oh, I had lots of friends, yeah. naturally, right. Uh -huh. oh. Well, you did very well um, to, you know, live on your own mm -hmm. for that long and then... and then. Uh, but I never sold my house. Jack is renting it. Right. We still, he's, it's still owned. Oh, yeah. She still owns her home. Aren't you something? Yeah. yeah and so, um, I'm not going to ask the address of that because that's that's too current, you know, we don't like people knowing personal things, mm -hmm. that personal. So um, now you're living up here in Sparks in this very lovely uh, facility, facility and you're, uh, both of your stepchildren are near and you have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I have, and, yes, right. Well, so tell me about that. What can I say? Well, Sheila has two sons. She had a daughter and the daughter passed away, unfortunately. Oh, so Very lovely daughter. Beautiful daughter. Gorgeous. She was gorgeous. And she has two sons. And one son is single. That's the oldest, Arno. Jean is married to Holly. They have a daughter. And that's it. That's the lot of family. It's a lot of family. Mm -hmm. And what about Jack? Jack is uh, has a son, a son in Oregon. He has a son in in, Re in Sparks, and he has a daughter in Reno. Oh, that's wonderful that they're all here. For they're, all here. they're all here. They're all here. Your great grandchildren. Oh right? yeah, you got yes. great grandchildren. Uh, great great grandchildren. Really? Huh. Wow. And they're all here too. All of them, yeah. Well, then it's wonderful that you moved up here. Well, it was time. Yeah. It was time. And I'm very happy here. Well, very I'm, happy. I'm a real believer that young children need to know their ancestors. But your wonderful influence on them, they will remember. And, you know, that, that's like what we do is do histories. But because you're here with them, their lives will be enriched. I hope so. I hope I'm not a burden. <laughs> I hope I'm not a burden. No. Christiane and John said they met you at your birthday party. What? At they, my birthday party. Oh, at your birthday party. Oh, it was my 70th birthday party. It was party. Sheila's birthday party. And how old are you at this time? I'm 93. 93? Mm -hmm. 
I'm an old bag. <laughs> well, you're doing very well. I'm, Thank you. you know, so you're very alert. And, and uh, is there um, things you thought of while we were talking? You want to just talk about anything? I mean, is there? What do you want me to talk about? Well, I'm just sort of wondering. Sometimes there's a motto you live by, you know, a little saying, or there's a, a something you would want. You know what my motto is? Be true to yourself. Oh. Be true to yourself and you'll have a good life. Oh. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No, well, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn the speaker off, the recorder. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, Mona and, and Beatrice again, and I've, I've turned the tape back on. And because I was thinking about NASA and the years you were at NASA was a lot to do with going to the moon and stuff. That's right. So um, t tell me about working at NASA when NASA's going to the moon. I did not work at NASA. But NASA was on the facility that I worked on. Oh. So I would go to the NASA office huh. and saw the shuttle, I'd go into the, saw how the shuttle was being put together. Top, top secret. Everything was top, top secret. You had a clearance that went way back to, to your parents' parents' life, you know. You were, that well scrutinized. Mm -hmm. So I had a top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. Just have it to this day and never cleared it. Yeah. And when you went in to NASA to see what they were doing with the rocket, you had to wear the suits, the hat, the gloves, the shoes, because it was so sanitary, very sanitary. Everybody that went into there was garb that way. That's the way they work there. Wow. And did that have something to do with your safety job? Well, I had to go there for various reasons. I won't go into that. You had to, you had, you had to go there for various reasons, okay? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. hmm. Well, NASA is just a romantic notion, you know, as in Brave New World, Exploring Space. So I just think that must have been very exciting. It was an exciting time for NASA. Well, I remember, Frank, there was an open house. And at that time, they were putting the shuttle together. So I took Frank with me, my husband, and I said, honey, I want to show you the shuttle. And Frank was so impressed with that shuttle, he couldn't stop talking about it. He was so impressed, and I was too, you know, that's a big project. I mean, you can't imagine what goes into a shuttle. You can't imagine in your wildest imagination. Mm. Well, yeah, no, that's true. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, Earlier on, you said you remembered vividly when Franklin Delano Roosevelt died, and that was 1945. Mm -hmm. And were you already in Germany? Not, no, not, not in 1935. 45. 40, oh, in 1945? No, I was not in Germany at that time. Uh -huh. and I but, didn't go to Germany until 1950. Oh, uh-huh. So where were you when FDR died? What were you doing? That's a good question. I really can't. I was living in the Chicago area, I know that. Mm -hmm. But you remember it because it was so poignant. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, my mother had a picture of FDR until the day she died. Mm. It was hanging on the wall. Oh. Wow. And that's something. And um, you like to dance. Love to dance. I thought if I didn't dance, I'd die. <laughs> so, um, 
course, there were dance halls all over the place. USOs and oh, just during the war, clubs and oh, big bands, dance halls. It was a wonderful era. Because yeah. uh, I was growing up then. What was I, 18, 19 years old? Right. Yeah. So, um, the, one of the things the History Project does is uh, suffrage when women got the right to vote. And nationally that was 1920. Did you ever hear any stories of your mom or your grandma who might have worked for No, towards? I do. Re my mother was very happy to go to the polls. This was a big, big experience yeah. for a woman to go to the polls and vote. Yeah, so she actually talked about oh, that. Oh, yes, she was thrilled that she could cast a ballot. Uh -huh. Did she work towards that, you know, marching no, or anything? Just, but when she did, she exercised her right. Oh, hand. absolutely. She was, yeah. I mean, the ballot had to be properly marked and studied the whole bit, yes. Yeah, well, they're getting to a big anniversary nationally for, for um, right to vote. But in Nevada, we beat the feds by six years. Mm -hmm. And we, we got to vote earlier yeah. you know, than the feds did. So I was just wondering, because that's just the right time frame for women to feel that first right. time. Well, that was quite an experience for them. Yeah. You know, women were held back. Mm -hmm. Women were in the household. Mm -hmm. They did step out of the household. They were a housewife. Yeah, they would take care of the family and the kids, and that was it. They didn't go to work. It sounds like your folks encouraged you um, to be more independent, and did did they help you? Leave well, my home father and... died in 1933, when you were nine, and so, I was what nine years old or ten years old, mm -hmm. and I had three brothers, and uh, they were still in their junior year. And my mother had to go to work because of the mortgage on the house. She did not want to lose that house. Now we're talking about depression years, but she went to work in this very, very, Lake Forest is a very wealthy community on the North Shore of, between Chicago and Waukegan, on the North Shore, right on Lake Michigan. Very well, the armors and the swifts and the big packing people had beautiful estates there. And my mother went to work in Lake Forest in the Deer Path Inn, which was a very exclusive, very exclusive hotel. I'll never forget, that hotel had cork floors. Never have I seen a cork floor since. But that hotel had cork floors because they were silent. You didn't hear a sound in that hotel because it was, you were walking on cork floors, not wood, cork. So my mother got a job in the Deer Path Inn to pay the mortgage on the house. She had to go to work. But then she, so she encouraged you to do the same, be independent and go out there and... I had to be independent. I yeah. didn't have a mama to look after me. She went to work. Yeah. I remember having a key to the house. I had to let myself, you know, and, and I had my chores I had to do around the house. Mm -hmm. I, you know, what can a youngster do when you're young? You do the best you can in cleaning and so on. But my job was to take care of the bathroom. Mm. <laughs> That bathroom had to be meticulously clean. We only had one bathroom. And you had two brothers. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> that had to be meticulously clean, and that was my job. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it just seems like you, were, you did so well um, being comfortable in yourself, like you said, to go and work with the government and go to Europe. And I mean, those are very self-esteem-based things. You had no problem with being confident. Well, to I have during the war. I worked in for. I worked for a defense plant because mm -hmm. I, when I graduated from high school, war broke out. Uh -huh. So I worked in the defense plant all during the war. Oh, uh huh. Oh, so you were a Rosie the Riveter. What? You were a Rosie the Riveter. 
No, I was an inspector. Oh yeah, neat. <laughs> uh, my job was that of an inspector. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which defense plant? What's it called? Vascaloy Raymet. Vas it was a part of Fansteel Metallurgical Company, a oh. big company at that time. Huh. Well, they made neat. all kinds of war material. Oh, wow. Huh. So you were working on the home front for the war before you got your government job. Oh, I worked during the all during the war. I worked in the defense plant. Uh -huh. Wow, neat. Yeah, I've been reading biographies about ladies that did that, you know, during the war because it was very different. Mm -hmm. That whole era of women getting jobs in oh, places. Oh, it, it like was that. completely different. Yeah, it opened up the world for women. Yeah. Did you work with? Uh, blacks and Hispanics and anyone that wanted to work got a job. Yeah, that's what was so they needed workers desperately. Yeah, that was miraculous. That uh -huh. interracial meld. So, huh? So you you were an inspector in a defense plant. That's right. Uh huh. And how did you find that government job that you had next? How did you find that job? I had to apply for it. Like after the war ended. Yeah, but that was working for the government. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I went through civil, they called it civil service at the time. Uh -huh. So I had to go to set, I had to apply for it. Mm -hmm. We filled out a form, a great thing. Form 57, I'll never forget that damn thing, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> it was that long. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, you must have done well. Yeah. But yeah. during the war, my girlfriend and I took a trip to San Francisco. And uh, that's when I fell in love with California. My brothers were stationed here. My brother was a merchant marine, and the other was a welder. He was working in Vallejo, California, working on the ships. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend and I came to visit them. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget, I said to Sophie, Oh, Sophie, one of these days I'm going to live here in San Francisco. And she said, Oh, yes, and I'm going to live on the moon. <laughs> Well, you win. <laughs> what were your brothers' names? What? What were your brothers' names? Michael and William. Mm -hmm. Michael and William. Yeah. One was a welder. He became a master welder. Very. He transferred down to Fort Wainimi in Southern California. Oh. Which he was one? a master welder. Oh yeah, which brother? Very. He did a lot of intricate work. Intricate. And, and my other brother was a merchant marine. He stayed in the merchant marine all his life. Which name goes with which brother? Michael was the master welder, and William was the merchant marine. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got sick. So I had to step in and do his work. I was doing a man's job. And I said, doggone it, I'm doing a man's job. I want to be a safety manager. So I applied every time a job, nothing. Doors were always closed. So at that time, I said, I'm going to file a complaint. So I filed an EEO complaint. It was a long, drawn out of process, very long, drawn out. But I won my case. I won my case, and I became a safety manager, the only female safety manager in the area. Wow. Wow. And they didn't discriminate further because you've made a mat or anything? They, oh, they couldn't discriminate. They right. already discriminated right. against you. They had to follow the rules. So that's when you got reclassified to the right salary? Oh, yeah. and, and not only that, wow. it gave me a better... You're in the service, civil service, you're graded. You have grades, and they're numbers, like a GS9, a GS7, 9, 11, 12, so on and so forth. So it gave me a chance to go up the ladder. So when I retired, I was a GS12, which is a very high-ranking number in the government force. Yeah. And it helped your retirement amount. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. So that makes you one of those trailblazer ladies for all the women that went behind you. That's right. I opened the door. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's neat. Well, congratulations, and thank thanks you. for telling us that.
Well, Sheila brought that up. Thank you, honey. Thank I you didn't for know bringing if I that could, up. It had to be recorded, but I that makes me just so proud of you. <laughs> oh, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.